I'm really excited to welcome you for week two of our Admitted Student Week. Uh, this afternoon, uh, you're in for quite a treat. We have one of our law faculty members who traditionally teaches in the first year experience, uh, who's happy to provide you with a criminal law class. So at this time, uh, please, you know, give a warm welcome to Professor Stephen Arik Ko, uh, and welcome to Criminal Law at BC Law. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dean McShay, and welcome everyone. I'm going to share my screen. So as Dean McShay said, it's uh, my name is Professor Ko, and this is uh, an introduction to criminal law. Allison Sherwood, are you there? Allison, if, if you're there, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Allison. Um, uh, Allison, I can't see you on the video. Can you, can you uh, show yourself on the video or is that not possible for you right now? Um, I should be able to, sorry about that. Okay, great. Al Allison, I wanna open by asking you a question. I'm having a dispute with my next door neighbor. He's playing music too loudly. So I decide that I'm going to kill him. I go out, I get a gun, uh, and then I walk over, I, I decide on the day I'm gonna do it, and then I walk next door, I pull out the gun, I shoot him in the head, and he dies. Have I done something morally wrong? Yeah, I'd say so. Why? You took another man's life. Took another man's life, that's something that's morally wrong. Cooper Lerner, you agree with that? Absolutely, and you did it in a premeditated way. I did it in a premeditated way. So in your conception, Cooper, is this, is this murder? Absolutely. What, what's your definition of murder? My definition of murder would be killing another person in a premeditated way. So you planned to do this, you took the action. So what, what if, so it has to be premeditated? What if I just spontaneously decided to kill my neighbor, then it wouldn't be murder? I'd say it would be, I actually don't know. Okay. Jelana Torres, you agree that's murder? And yes. that I've done something morally wrong? Yes. Should yes. I be punished for that for that wrong? Um, yeah, I would say so just because like um, Cooper said, it was premeditated. Uh -huh, it was premeditated. How much punishment do you think is appropriate? For murdering somebody? Um, I don't know, maybe like five to 10 years in prison. <laughs> five to 10 years in prison. So you think after 10 years, I can be back out on the streets? Yeah, depending on like what you did in prison to can reform yourself. Okay, all right, all right. So maybe there's a question of reformation and rehabilitation in criminal law. Grace, Bear. Yeah. Hi, Grace. So Hi. same facts as initially. Mm -hmm. um, my neighbor's playing music too loudly. I decide I'm going to kill him. I go out, I buy the gun. I'm walking next door and I see a police car. Mm -hmm. So I turn back and go home and nothing happens to my neighbor. Have I done something morally wrong? Um, no. Why not? Because you didn't see the action through. I didn't see the action through. So you think it's morally appropriate behavior for me to walk uh, to my neighbor's house with a gun intending to kill him. That's morally okay. Okay, maybe not. No, it's not okay. Okay, so it's not okay. Okay. So, hey, Yang, do you agree with that? I agree. So it's morally inappropriate behavior. Have I committed murder? No. Why not? Um, well, you didn't go in and kill him, right? I didn't go in and kill him. So I've done something morally wrong, but I haven't committed murder. Ryan O'Malley, should I be punished for, for, for this? Is it, I, I didn't commit murder, but I did something morally problematic. Uh, yes, you should be punished for attempted murder. For attempted murder? How much punishment is appropriate for attempted murder, you think? It depends on your mental faculties. Okay, well, well, you know my mental faculties now after seeing me for a couple of minutes. What do you think the appropriate punishment is for me? Um, the appropriate punishment would be a jury trial. But that's not a punishment. I'm, I'm talking about years of imprisonment. So we heard previously from Jelana, five to 10 years. 
Would you give me more or less than five to 10 years? Um, I believe that five to 10 years sounds appropriate. Okay, so you think I should be punished the same amount as if I had gone over and pulled the trigger and killed him? You think that's right? No, I think that if so, you actually killed him, you should be tried for more than five to 10 years. I see. Okay, I see. So you have a different conception of punishment than Jelana does. I'm going to launch a poll now. Can people see this? Is punishment appropriate in this case? Should I be punished at all? Sorry, is this in the second case? Or in the second case. I'm talking about the second case right now. Yeah. And I know none of you, you know, this is all just testing your intuition to bring you into what I think is the most interesting area of the law, the criminal law. Okay, we have 91% voting. A few more people want to jump in on this. It's completely anonymous. I'll never check afterwards. So let's see here. We had a very interesting split, very, very close. Some people thought punishment was appropriate in this case. Some people did not. And 14% of us were unsure. Two more hypotheticals. Nicholas Russell, you there, Nicholas? Yeah, I'm here. So same initial fat pattern. Uh, can you turn your video on, Nicholas, or is that too difficult for you right now? I'm sorry, I'm at work right now, so I can't okay. do that. All right, no problem, no problem. We'll, we'll, we'll do it this way, we'll do it this way. So same fat pattern. Uh, my roommates, uh, my next door neighbors play music too loudly. I decided I'm gonna kill my next door neighbor. Uh, but instead of me going to the next door neighbor's house and, and killing the next door neighbor, I go out and I ask my friend to kill my neighbor. And I pick my friend up in a car. I drive him to the house. My, my friend gets out of the car that I've driven, kills the neighbor, gets back in the car, and we drive away. Same three questions for you now, Nicholas. Have I done something morally wrong? Have I committed murder? Should I be punished? I think, yes, you've done something morally wrong. And yes, you should be punished. Though I'm not sure that you committed murder, I think that you are certainly an accessory to the murder. Okay, so you think I'm an accessory to the murder. There's something uh, different here and I've done something morally wrong. Uh, and, and how much punishment do you think is appropriate here, Nicholas? We, we've heard five to 10 years for murder. We've heard um, also someone say less than five to 10 years uh, for, for uh, attempted murder. I mean, I guess I would probably say you should be put away for longer than that. Honestly, okay. I, maybe I'm a little bit more strict on that, but I think that five, 10 years would be the minimum amount for Okay, being. so five, 10 years minimum. Okay, and, and I've got the poll open again here. I wanna see if punishment is appropriate in this case. I'll just give this another minute here and then I'll move on to the final hypo um, before I um, move away from this. We had a whopping 96% of people say punishment is appropriate in this case. And Nicholas, you think that's right, right? You, your, your classmates agree with you. Yes. Okay, great, great. All right, we'll move on to one final one here. One final hypothetical of our four. I, I have a serious um, psychiatric disorder. I'm a paranoid schizophrenic. The voices in my head tell me that, um, that I should kill my next door neighbor. So I go next door, I, I take out a gun, uh, I pull the trigger and I, and I kill the neighbor. Uh, Lauren McCarthy. Uh, I'm here. La uh, uh, Lawrence, excuse me. Um, is, is that appropriate? Is that, is that, did I do something morally wrong? Did I commit murder? Should I be punished? Um, you, did some, you did commit murder. You, uh, I don't know if you should be punished or maybe rehabilitated. Um, and it, I would I would say it's morally wrong objectively, but uh, I don't think that person thought in the moment it was morally wrong. Yeah, so maybe I did something morally wrong, uh, and maybe technically it's murder, but maybe I should not be punished. Punished. That's your that's your argument. Mm -hmm. Well, Lawrence, I mean, why, why should I not be punished? I mean, I've killed someone. I've killed someone just like uh, I killed someone in the first scenario where I had able mental faculties. Why should we make a distinct distinction there between punishment? 
because I don't think your mental faculties would be the same as in, they were in the first case. Uh -huh. So you're saying that in our criminal justice system, we should make some sort of determination differently based on the mental faculties of the individual? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to share the results of this poll. This is an interesting one. We, we were split even more on this one in a way. Again, more people trending towards punishment, but a few more people saying they're not sure. Okay. So again, welcome to Boston College Law School. Welcome to the study of the criminal law. And for those of you who are curious about what a criminal law course may look like, these four hypotheticals, as we call them, factual hypotheticals, give you the overview of what an entire criminal course is. I've given you the entire outline of the course just in the opening uh, 10 minutes. We start in this course with the basic elements of criminality, but then we move on to the question, is it murder? That's what I teach in unit two of my course. It's called offenses. I turn back, that's something called inchoate offenses. For example, attempted murder. I drove into the house. That's something that we call accomplice liability or modes of liability. What happens when there's more than one person? How do these questions intersect? And finally, I have schizophrenia it has to do with the question of justifications of ex and excuses. We look at uh, uh, questions of insanity, as the law calls it. We look at questions of uh, self-defense. What happens if my neighbor is coming at me with a gun and then I pull my gun and, and pull the trigger? How does the law treat those questions? Those are the foundational questions of criminal law and the foundational questions of a criminal law course. This is the course where we talk about uh, the death penalty and Noor Mayor Khan, Noor, are you there? Okay, Virginia uh, Ambilotis. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Virginia. Why do you think I assigned the death penalty um, for this class, for this opening class? Um, because it has to do with federal law versus state law, and it's very controversial. And um, there's degrees, there's like the crime versus like the sentencing and all these different layers. That's right. So there's crime, there's sentencing, there's federalism, there's, there's federal government, there's state government. But the ultimate answer is the reason why I signed the death penalty as the opening reading is because the criminal law is the only area of law where at the end of the process, the state can take your life. If in all these other areas of law, property law, contract law, uh, you know, people cannot be executed by the state, but the criminal law deals with violations of the laws that are serious, so serious that you could be committed to life imprisonment without parole or at the extreme, you could be executed. From my perspective, this is what makes criminal law the most important course and the most exciting course uh, in the first year curriculum. This is the course where we talk about the Capitol riots and how the criminal justice system intersects uh, with FBI investigations around the Capitol riots and the various prosecutions around the country. In this course, we talk about Bernie Madoff and what sentencing is appropriate for someone who's committed his crimes. Uh, in my course, we talk about the Michelle Carter texting case. Should someone be responsible if they have goaded someone into committing suicide or should they not? We talk about Harvey Weinstein uh, and, and the way in which he was prosecuted for, for sexual assault. And finally, we talk about, uh, we do all of this in the context of uh, understanding that criminal justice intersects with, intersects with various communities, especially marginalized communities and communities of color. We are studying criminal law in an era of mass incarceration where we are asking fundamental questions about who should be prosecuted, who should be put on trial, and who should be put in prison, and who should not. Increasingly, as a country, we are asking those fundamental questions. And uh, once you come, if you were to come to Boston College Law School and take criminal law with me or any of my colleagues, you would be equipped with the tools to engage in this debate in a very uh, robustly defined way. So what will we be doing over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes? We began with the opening four questions. Uh, I'll introduce myself very briefly, just so, so you have a sense of who I am and also what a criminal uh, legal career might look like, what a legal career might look like even more generally. We'll talk about the death penalty and then I'll offer some concluding thoughts about studying law at Boston College Law School, which I think is a very special place to study 
uh, law, and and I'm uh, looking forward to to getting to know you uh, as we as we work through all of this today. Before we do, though, I just want to say a word on the subject matter. This is a very difficult course, and the materials that are presented today are very challenging. Those of you who have read it know that. We're talking about murder. We're talking about rape. We're talking about uh, uh, racial disparities when it comes to treatment in the criminal justice system. So I just want to emphasize, I recognize this is the subject matter is very difficult and that all of us are coming to this conversation informed by our own experiences. Some of us, most of us, uh, either directly or indirectly have been touched by the criminal justice system, either because um, some of us uh, come from families or have friends who have been victims of crimes. Some of us have been victims of crimes. Some of us have been mistreated by the criminal justice system and, and, and others of us uh, are conscious of the way in which uh, loved ones have been mistreated by the criminal justice system. So I wanna say that I, I recognize the challenge of that and I encourage, of all, I encourage all of us to be respectful as we have that conversation today. Okay, let's move on with introductions briefly before we get into the subject matter. Who am I? Uh, again, I'm, uh, my name is Professor Ko and I'm from Massachusetts actually. My family is ethnically half Lebanese and half Korean. Uh, this is a picture of my family, and this is our dog, Riley, uh, Bijan per se. We often say that, um, you know, we grew up with a French dog with an Irish name in a Korean Lebanese American household. Uh, my first introduction to international affairs, uh, which is my other major interest along with criminal law, was when I studied abroad in England. Uh, and then when I went to law school, I had a particular interest in international law. I did a human rights a clinic in Colombia. I studied comparative law in France. My main mentor was Zambian. I clerked for a federal judge. And then a very interesting thing happened. I graduated in 2008 and my law firm gave me this amazing deal. They said, you uh, should take a year off and we'll pay you half your salary and you'll have a guaranteed job on the other end. So I literally had 12 months uh, and, and a good chunk of change to do whatever I wanted. Um, knowing that there was going to be a law firm job on the other end. So what did I do with my time? Uh, I did, I road tripped around the United States. I was a visiting scholar at a law school in Korea. Uh, I spent time in Lebanon uh, and, and studied Arabic. Uh, but then I went to The Hague. One of my main mentors said, The Hague is the international law capital of the world. If you go there, you can understand how international law functions in our global order. So first I went to the International Criminal Court and that's when I studied, that's where the criminal aspects started coming into my interest. I worked on uh, cases dealing with genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, sentencing. And then for two years, I worked uh, for another court in The Hague, um, which is run by the United Nations called the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. I dealt with one of the main cases uh, there working for these the four judges. After that, I went to the Department of Justice in Washington, DC, and I worked on international criminal cases again, but from the perspective of the US government. Uh, as many of you know, the Department of Justice is one of uh, the executive agencies, one of the most important agencies in the federal government. This is an internal organizational chart of the DOJ, and you can see that there are different subsections here. So here's the Attorney General up here at the top of the heap, Civil Rights Division, Tax Division. Here's the FBI. Uh, I worked in the criminal division here, dealing with enforcement of federal criminal law. And within the criminal division here, I worked in the Office of International Affairs. So some of you may have seen our uh, you know, news articles about uh, you know, extraditing El Chapo from Mexico, prosecuting Nicolas Maduro from Venezuela, uh, you know, cases dealing with Chinese uh, COVID-19 vaccine research theft. All of these are international cases that, that I and my office have worked on in the past or are working on now. And during that time, I was also an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law Center and was also a fellow at Columbia Law School before finally becoming a, a professor of my own uh, here at Boston College Law School. Uh, the, the final thing I'll say about, about this uh, story is that Boston College Law School uh, is very, very special to me uh, for the reason that I've been connected to BC law since before I was even born. My grandfather, my paternal grandfather was a graduate of Boston College Law School. Uh, and he was admitted to BC law by Father Drine the very famous former Dean who's a human rights hero among other things. 
uh, because my grandfather came to the United States for graduate studies and then was living in polit political exile from South Korea because uh, the South Korean government was overthrown. So I am uh, sitting here today because of Boston College Law School. My family owes a great deal to Boston College Law School and I have particular interest in JD students at Boston College Law School because I think of my grandfather uh, as I'm teaching uh, at this school all the time. As a final note, uh, why do I uh, teach criminal law and international law? What I like about criminal law is it's the most fundamental area of law. We're talking about, again, you know, murder, manslaughter, rape, kidnapping. These are the most serious violations of the law. And it really strongly pulls at my sense of justice and morality uh, in a way that I think hopefully it has for all of you thus far today. And I'm also interested in international law because of its questions of universality. What is it uh, that countries can come together and say it's fundamentally just or unjust? And that's why I write about things like the International Criminal Court, Nuremberg, Al Chapo, Julian Assange, the Mueller investigation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if we were in person, uh, I would ask each of you to do introductions. But of course, if we uh, engaged in that, then that would take the rest of the time here. But I can see all of you on my second screen. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Uh, I know Boston College Law School always admits the best of the best. So I know each of you has a unique story. Uh, and if and when you come to BC Law, I'm looking forward to hearing from each of you. I make a point of meeting with each of my students for 15 minutes one-on-one -on -one at the beginning of the semester. So if you're to come and if you're in my course, I'll look forward to getting to know you more in that capacity. I also just want to recognize two outstanding uh, Boston College Law students in the room right now, John Riley and Rachel Weiss, who are um, one's a two L, one's a three L. They have they have done excellent. Um, that they're they're leaders in their class. Uh, John's my former student is is really always uh, performed in an outstanding way. Uh, I welcome the two of them here, and uh, if we had more time, I'd also allow them to introduce themselves. But I want to thank them also for their presence. Uh, today as BC Law Ambassadors. I think their presence is also a reflection of how much the law students here at the law school care about each of you uh, and, and hope that you come. Okay, uh, let's move on now to talk about the death penalty. Now that, now that you have a better sense of who I am and where we're coming from, um, here is a picture of uh, the Bill of Rights. And this is a foundational document uh, in our country, especially the Eighth Amendment. Now, in, in the, the Bill of Rights endows individual rights on individual citizens. Many of us know this from our studies, from civics, uh, et cetera. And one of these rights um, is the Eighth Amendment. Anastasia Foley. Hi. Hi, Anastasia. Now, maybe you've seen the Eighth Amendment language before, maybe you haven't, but the Eighth Amendment here says, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. I wanna focus explicitly on this. Just, if I just present this to you and say the constitution says, the federal government cannot inflict cruel or unusual punishment. What does that sound like to you? Um. To me, it brings to mind issues of like torture, like violating other human rights in the process of punishing someone else. Yeah, so torture, violating human rights. Um, how do you know? So obviously, if it's, you know, so let me, well, let me ask you, uh, if all of a sudden the federal government said, we're going to start uh, waterboarding people uh, who've committed crimes here in the United States uh, on a regular basis, obviously the US government has done this in the past and it's morally reprehensible. Uh, do you think that would be cruel and unusual punishment? Yeah, I would consider that cruel and unusual punishment. Uh -huh. What about um, life imprisonment without parole? Do you think that's cruel and unusual to, to hold someone for their entire life? Um, I'm not sure about cruel and unusual, but I personally find it excessive, which I know it's not the language we're focusing on, but. Right, so, so excellent, so excellent. You, you are asking right now, you, know, you have a moral intuition, Anastasia, but you're also saying, what is the actual language? Maybe life imprisonment without parole is excessive, but is it cruel and unusual? 
that's an excellent question. And I can tell you're already exercising your legal faculties. Now, we're going to not just engage in what Anastasia and I have just done, which is just kind of read the phrase and just engage in our gut in intuition. We're going to look at the way in which cases in American law have thought about the meaning of this phrase. And by the time we're done today, you will have a better sense of what constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, when we think about who it applies to, when we think about for what crimes, and when we think about um, how it might impact uh, different communities differently given racial disparities, okay? Uh, why do we read cases? Cases are a source of law in the United States. So in fact, why don't you throw up a show of hands? You all know the raise hand function uh, in Zoom, right? Raise your hand if you've heard of the case Roe v. Wade or Brown v. v. Board of Education. Okay, great. So my screen is filling with raised hands. In fact, I think everyone has raised their hand, right? Okay, you can put your hand down now. Right, so why do we talk about these cases? We talk about these cases in American law because these cases are a source of law, just like the constitution, just like if Congress passes legislation, executive orders, when, when the Supreme Court especially, but all courts, when they decide a case, you can cite that case afterwards for that pro proposition with regard to um, uh, that interpretation of the law and it's binding in the future, just like if Congress passes a law. So when we read a case, we wanna understand what has the court done? We, we ask ourselves, what are the facts? What's the central legal question or the issue? How did the case reason through this? Uh, what is their holding or their ultimate legal conclusion? And was this case uh, rightly decided? That's an opinion question. And we're gonna work through these steps now uh, as we talk about some of the cases the Supreme Court uh, has addressed today. And again, the Supreme Court is, as many of you probably already know, is at the very top of the heap when it comes to our federal judiciary. So the Supreme Court has the final word on the meaning of cruel and unusual. It has a final word on the meaning of the Eighth Amendment and it's a final word on the meaning of the US uh, Constitution. That's why it's such an important institution and they specifically do it uh, through the means of what's called judicial review. Courts can review the actions of the legislative and the executive, and in particular, they may strike down a law as unconstitutional. Okay. All right. Matthews and Kevitz. Yeah. How are you doing today, Matthew? I'm doing pretty well. Good. Are you doing you? okay with this online class format? Is it, uh, is it, I don't love it. I don't love it in my undergrad and I don't think I'd love it in law school, but I'm getting through it. Okay, good. Well, you know, I'm teaching my criminal law class in person right now. BC has a commitment to teaching in person, at least for some of, every 1L has some in-person classes and I'm teaching in a socially distanced classroom. We're all wearing masks. We're very safe about it, but we are having the in-person experience. And um, I know we're doing it over Zoom today, but uh, well, hopefully things will be better in the fall. But even if not, uh, we are teaching in person at least to some degree. So, um, so let me ask you, Matthew. Matthew, did you get a sense of, uh, from the reading, uh, who can be executed? Do we execute people under the age of 18 and do we execute the mentally disabled? No. And, and, and how do you know that? Um, I read the cases, the Atkins versus Virginia and the McCleskey versus Kemp. Okay, great. So you're right. You're 100% right, Matthew. Good job. Okay, the Eighth Amendment prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, as we've already heard, um, and and Anastasia's engaged in an intuitive reading of that. Now we're looking at, well, what have the courts said? The courts have said that execution of ju juveniles under the age of 18, at time of commission of a crime, uh, is prohibited under the Eighth Amendment as cruel and unusual punishment, and also execution of the mentally disabled uh, is also a violation. Uh, of the Eighth Amendment uh, under un, um, under the cruel and unusual punishment clause. So Matthew, you mentioned Atkins v. Virginia. Uh, what happened in that particular case? Did, did you get a chance to re read the facts there? Yeah, I did. Um, Gail Atkins was convicted of abduction, uh, robbery, and ultimately capital murder and sentenced to death. And then um, he relied on one testimony from a doctor who said that he was mentally um, disabled. And then from there, um, 
it got he got sentenced to death and then it got appealed and then another doctor for the prosecution concluded he was not mentally disabled and he was sentenced to death again yeah excellent matthew matthew you've done an excellent job with that so that's exactly right right this defendant robs and kills a man in virginia he sends us to death but in the evidence below, in the record below, it, it turns out that he's so-called mildly mentally retarded. That's a term that, that the law uses, even though that's not a term that we use uh, anymore in our kind of colloquial language. And there's also evidence that he has an IQ of uh, uh, 59. So, so how is it that the court, um, let me ask someone else, Jonathan, Bertulis, Fernand, you're slightly cut off there at the end. That was a good attempt. Yeah, okay. Um, Jonathan, how does the court reason that, that people under the age of 18 cannot be executed? Um, oh, no, I'm sorry, we're talking about Atkins v. Virginia, that people with, with mental uh, disability cannot be executed. Um, I mean, I think it's, uh, let me look at my notes. It came down to the idea that um, they're not as aware of their actions. Um, so the sort of penological goals of deterrence and retribution aren't really fully achieved. Yeah, excellent, Jonathan. That's right, right? So the court has a, a to, to make cruel and unusual punishment real, the court has a standard of evolving standards of decency. And they're looking at a variety of things. They're looking at whether or not, um, you know, the direction of legislative change, how many states still allow this and how many don't. They're also looking at, uh, as you rightly said, retribution, deterrence, different rationales for punishment. And they're also looking at procedural protections, right? Does it make sense to, uh, to execute someone who, who has uh, an IQ of 59, right? And again, once the court decides, no, the mentally retarded are not eligible for the death penalty, then that changes the law in the entire uh, country. Jonathan, do you think this case was rightly decided? Um, I was kind of unsure about this one, to, to be honest with you. Okay, tell, tell, tell us why. And I'm throwing up a poll question as well to see what people think. Um, let me just reread it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, to be honest with you, I'm having difficulty recalling the, um, the exact. No, no problem. No, no, I mean, I mean, Jonathan, you know, you, you're you're just an admitted student, so this is this is a very friendly conversation. Mm -hmm. As a general rule, do you think there may be circumstances where, under the Constitution, people who have mental disability uh, should be executed by the state, or do you think, as a general rule, we should not engage in this? Um, I think as a general, we should not engage in it. Uh huh. And, and why not? Um, because I mean, so based on the readings, my understanding was um, that it would constitute a kind of cruel and unusual punishment because it's not actually achieving the, the penological goals um, of a punishment. Yeah, and, and you agree with that? It's not achieving the, the relevant penological goals. Yes. Yeah. So you know, let let I'll share the results here. We had uh, a lot of you know the majority of the class agrees that doesn't meet these penological goals. Retribution is punishing someone for what they did wrong. Deterrence is trying to dissuade others from engaging in this. Uh, but some people were not sure, right? And and those, does anyone want to volunteer? Who, who said no on this? Who thought this case was wrongly decided? And Anyone want to um, share their view? I'll take a volunteer. You can uh, raise your hand or you can just unmute yourself and, and speak. I'll jump in and say that it relied on the testimony of one doctor that was then rebutted by a different doctor. Okay. And in both circumstances, the case was decided with one expert witness. Okay, yeah. Okay, Cooper, so good. So Cooper is asking a question of evidentiary standards. How do we know? And Cooper might also say, maybe if we open up the door to people saying that they have mental incapacity, maybe any uh, person might start testifying that they have mental incapacity and then maybe avoid the death penalty. Um, so on one hand, we want to avoid things being cruel and unusual. On the other hand, uh, we want to have a space where um, we're not executing people who, who don't have the requisite faculties. Yeah, Therese Junot. Hi, um, similar to the previous point, I, um, the, what was it, the, the psychologist, I was not confident in his justification for calling um, Atkins mildly mentally retarded. He relied just on interviews with people. It says a review of school and court records and an IQ test. Yeah. I think um, 
I, I would want to see more in-depth analysis than that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So maybe, maybe there's not enough of analysis in this case uh, to, to proceed here. Yeah. Jordan, last word, and then we'll move on to Robert. Uh, yeah. Hi. So I actually, I originally voted uh, yes, that this was rightly decided, but I'm, I'm having a little bit of second thoughts now because uh, part of me feels like in this case where you have like competing experts and you have one expert saying one thing and one expert saying another, that we should kind of defer to the jury's decision in the sentencing guidelines. Because I mean, this the jury, two different juries came to the same conclusion twice that yeah. this individual should be sentenced to death based off of everything that they heard. And they had the opportunity to hear from the various experts and weigh that evidence. And yeah. so you have the court coming in and overturning two different juries. I feel like maybe we should have a little bit more of respect for the dual decision on the part of those two juries. Okay, so this is great. So I'm so happy with all of you because these are all different ways of approaching this question. One is, did someone do something morally wrong? Uh, another one is to, to say, is there enough evidence? That's a different sort of way of thinking about the question. Another one which Jordan is telling us is, how do courts interact? The Supreme Court is sitting up at the top of the heap of the mountain, but maybe in their, they're in their ivory tower. Maybe we should defer to the determinations that are made below and we should let the courts have some flexibility in this, right? So these are all great questions. And these are the sorts of questions that we grapple with in law school. Is this case rightly decided? Uh, should, should cruel and unusual punishment, which could mean anything in theory, how should this apply in this particular case? And Roper v. Simmons, uh, which we'll, I'll just say in the interest of time, has very similar uh, issues with this kind of analogous reasoning to Atkins. For those of you who read it probably saw, the court is again kind of drawing on that same type of analysis uh, and kind of asking who is deserving of punishment, right? Uh, how are juveniles similar or different? And again, going to Jordan's point, why not leave it to the lower courts? What, what, what about the facts of the case? Shouldn't we allow the courts to have some freedom in determining um, uh, when an individual, whether because of mental capacity or IQ or because of age uh, uh, should be, should be uh, uh, received the death penalty? There's also a question for you to consider, which we won't talk about today, but just to highlight a question of foreign law, right? Justice Kennedy talks about how it doesn't lessen our fidelity to the constitution to acknowledge fundamental rights by other nations and people that uh, underscores the centrality of the rights of, of the United States. So a question you can ask yourself and a question we debate in law school is, to what degree are we thinking globally about rights? To what degree are we thinking globally about the trends when it comes to the death penalty. Increasingly, the United States is in the minority when it, with the use of the death penalty. Some people say that's a good thing. Some people say that's a bad thing. And some people say the justices should be able to look around the world and compare laws. And some people say the justices should not. They should just keep their eyes uh, on the US Constitution, on domestic considerations. It's another question for us uh, to, to think about. OK. Samuel Wynn. Yes. Samuel, uh, the, 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 the casebook talks a little bit about, at, at the very beginning of the chapter, uh, which crimes can trigger the death penalty. Do we, do we, do we uh, execute people for any sort of offense, just for kind of just regular old, someone just walks down the street and steals a Snickers bar out of the 7-Eleven? Uh, Atkins describes crimes that are particularly uh, depraved, uh, and they found that the average murderer did not fit the bill. So oh, that's right. So right, that's right. Yeah. Particularly depraved crimes, and the casebook also talks about uh, on page fifty-six. You know, the death penalty is really only available now uh, in homicide cases. I, I, someone has to have killed someone else in order for a case to be death penalty uh, eligible. There's an exception for treason, but really, when you hear that someone's been executed by the state, we're really only thinking about um, we're really only thinking about uh, killings. Okay. But does that, Samuel, does that make sense to you? I mean, what about this case here, this R.L. Castro case that's mentioned uh, in the reading? So this is a case, and if you didn't get a chance to, to take a look at it, that's okay. Very, very difficult facts to, to talk about, but very important to think about these questions. He pled guilty to 937 counts of rape and kidnapping, uh, holding three women captive for a decade. He's sentenced to a life of imprisonment plus a thousand years because each of those individual acts triggers more years of imprisonment. Um, 
he ultimately commits suicide in 2013. So my question is, uh, would you support the use of the death penalty in this case? And are non-homicide cases always less blameworthy or serious than homicide cases? I'm going to open this up to a poll question. Uh, what is the appropriate punishment for Ariel Castro? Benjamin Wurzba, which way did you which way did you vote here? Uh, I actually voted sort of against my conscience. Uh, I voted the letter of the law, which I think in this case probably should have been death penalty as a very serious uh, crime. But I'm personally against the death penalty, so I can't let that factor in here for the for the purposes of this class. <laughs> okay, so 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 that's great. So but 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 the letter of the law says that we don't execute someone unless they've killed, that's what we just said. So this guy didn't kill anyone, but he engaged in really, really horrific conduct. So the letter of the law would say, you can't uh, execute him for this. Uh, do you think that's right? Should, should he be death penalty eligible? Uh, I, again, as I said earlier, personally, I, I don't believe that anyone should be, uh, yeah. but I, I think that if we are uh, under the law executing the most um egregious of crimes this would certainly seem to be near the top yeah um yeah. even though it doesn't have um yeah the homicide aspect okay yeah yes yeah. 74 percent of our class said life imprisonment so it seems like a lot of our class has this intuition that you know we should really not put him to death for this but he should suffer the second most serious uh consequence does anyone, I'll take a volunteer. How, does someone else want to share how they voted on this question? Yeah, I can share. Yeah, um, go ahead. Jelana, yo, yeah, good to see you again. <laughs> um, I voted for the death penalty in this one just because when I was reading through the case, like in the beginning sections when it talked about retribution, yeah. I'm just thinking about the nine, I don't know, maybe he raped one woman more than once, but just the victims and making sure that they feel like their voice was heard. Yeah. Um, so I think I think just because he didn't murder someone per se, he caused a lot of harm to these women, and I think that just the 937 counts just shows a very disregard for life that is, probably, in my opinion, equivalent to murdering somebody. Yeah. So that's a great point, Jelana. You know, we need to think about the victims here. Criminal justice is not just about the state going after people. This is about the state providing accountability for crimes. That uh, that people may not have otherwise. Yeah, Riley Doak, I see your hand raised. Hi, um, I never thought that I would vote for the death penalty. I'm from Cleveland. I was in high school in 2013, um, so this case is a little bit different. Um, and knowing what these victims went through, I thought that the closure that they would receive from the death penalty in this case, despite the fact that it doesn't, based on what the law says, meet that standard, I thought that that would be more just. Okay, all right, great, great. Okay, so, so you know, I think this is great. People are challenging their intuitions here and we're really starting to become more systematic, rigorous thinkers about when the death penalty should, should apply and when it should not apply. And again, these are the sort of critical skills that we build in law school as we work through these cases. A lot of times we kind of default to our intuition, but now we're actually defaulting to our legal uh, experience. And I, I love that there's other hands raised. I wanna to get to more people, uh, but I also wanna make sure that we, we cover the final question of racial disparities with the death penalty, which is a critical, critical question in our society today. And I wanna tee that up with a quick video that's ripped from our headlines. I can still see Jelana on my screen. Jelana, you, you can see this, right? The, the video? Yeah. Okay, great. And can you just give me a thumbs up if you can hear the audio once I start playing? Sure. Thanks. A federal prison in the United States has carried out the execution of a convicted killer, Brandon Bernard. The African-American man was part of a gang who abducted, robbed and murdered two white youth ministers in 1999. Well, he's the ninth federal inmate to have been put to death since July. More federal prisoners have been executed in the U.S. this year 
than in the previous 56 years combined. Le Budiseco has this report. Brandon Bernard had been on death row for the last 20 years and on Thursday he became the first federal prisoner to be executed during the presidential transition. It's one of five that are scheduled. If the rest go ahead, Donald Trump will have overseen the deaths of 13 federal inmates since July this year, more than any president in over a century. The federal death penalty was reinstated in 1988, but executions were rare. Just three had taken place since then, and none since 2003. But in July, the Trump administration resumed the practice after a 17-year hiatus. Brendan Bernard's case had attracted the support of celebrities like Kim Kardashian West. The reality star and prison reform activist had called on her followers to tweet Donald Trump to save Mr. Bernard. And tomorrow, another federal execution is scheduled at the same penitentiary in Indiana. These executions come just weeks before Joe Biden takes office, and he has said that he will seek to end the death penalty. The incumbent president would usually defer to his successor and let the president-elect set the course. But Donald Trump's attorney general says he is just following the law. He says he owes it to the victims and their families to carry forward this sentence. Le Boutiseco, BBC News, Washington. Okay, so I show this to kind of underscore just how, how it is that all, all of these different uh, cases are uh, very much arising in, in our news. And I also do this uh, because it shows the power of uh, criminal law and being a law student to kind of understand how it is that these cases are unfolding. And I do this in order to show, uh, it's because it interfaces uh, very well with McCleskey v. Kemp, which is one of the most controversial cases in the history of the US uh, Supreme Court. Uh, Sarah Cicchetti? Sarah, just in the interest of time, can you, can you tell us what the central statistical finding was uh, by the Baldus study? And did the court find that there was a constitutional violation given the disparities that, that were found in, in this particular case? So the central finding was that um, if the victim of a murder was white, there was a 4.3 times higher um, death penalty ruling. Yeah. Um, and the court did not find that that was a constitutional issue. Um, they found that this took place in Georgia. They found that the court system in Georgia was impartial and could operate in a in an objective way. That's right, right. So, so excellent job, Sarah. So, right, this this is the Baldus study, and this is uh, another one of the studies from the same individual. This is from from a different point in time, but showed the race of the defendant, the victim, in combination with the role in prosecutors and multiple findings showing disproportionate use of the death penalty on black defendants, especially when white victims are killed, right? Just like in the Bernard case that we've just seen uh, from, from uh, just, just the, the, the end of the Trump administration. Uh, and the court ultimately, as Sarah told us, rejected discriminatory claims saying this did not amount to a constitutional violation, either under 14th Amendment uh, due process and equal protection uh, but also under the Eighth Amendment. In other words, this was not cruel and unusual punishment. This was not disproportionate. This was a discrepancy that appears to, to correlate with race. So let me ask this question to all of you. Uh, was this case rightly decided? Okay, and I'll share the results. Uh, almost half the class said no. A lot of people said they weren't sure. And a few people said uh, yes, rightly decided, right? Uh, and I'll take, I'll take one volunteer who wants to give their, their view on this. Again, acknowledging this is a very difficult issue to discuss. Yeah, Dell Smith, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, so I 
went with yes, but it went against uh, my intuition. Uh -huh. um, the the biggest thing for me was um, the when the court basically said uh, that the Baldus study kind of applied to uh, or it, it could it held up against like jury selection and uh, I, I forgot the other example they used, uh, but in this case. Um, for McCluskey to claim that um, uh, he was discriminated against uh, was a far stretch because you know each case has different facts and yeah. all of that. Um, and, and also the point that stuck out to me was uh, the court said, "Well, if this was the case, the the Georgia State Legislature has more than enough ability to uh, put a new law in place that bars um, discrimination as well." Right, right. So, right. So the court's saying there's a case by case analysis. The states may do things differently. And for Dell, that's persuasive, right? Uh, and, and, you know, if you come to BC Law, again, if you're in my class, this is a case that we debate uh, very fully uh, in class because for those of us who are concerned about criminal justice and systemic racism, this case in some ways is ground zero for thinking about this question. Because what essentially what the court does is it says, there's a correlation, uh, but correlation does not mean causation. And the individual defendant has to show racism, uh, and it has to show racial motivation in every particular case. Uh, but for those of us who are aware of the fact that we're living in an era of mass incarceration, this case is very infamous for insulating. Uh, for those of you, how many of you show of hands have, have heard of or read this book, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander? Yeah, so a bunch of people. So Michelle Alexander famously said that this case immunized uh, the criminal justice system from judicial scrutiny for racial bias. And the case was a so-called 5-4 decision. Um, so just very, very narrowly, um, the court decided against uh, the defendant. Uh, but Justice Powell later on in his career said uh, if he could have changed any vote, he would have changed the vote in McCleskey v. Kent. Okay, so when I teach, uh, I always, to be clear, I always finish by uh, sharing my takeaways for my students so they know exactly what we've covered and they have a sense of exactly where we've been. Again, today we opened with four uh, hypotheticals and I introduced you to what a criminal law course may look like. I also did introduce you to myself. We talked about the death penalty and the kind of critical takeaways are that uh, a 101 criminal law class asks foundational questions about the definition of crimes, the nature of punishment, and the scope of criminal liability. The death penalty highlights the high stakes of criminal law. It does not now apply to juveniles or the mentally disabled. It applies only to homicide uh, and applies despite the fact that there are racial uh, disparities. Uh, and the final case in particular underscores uh, the, my attitude when I teach criminal law is to rigorously understand the function of criminal justice, we must uh, be careful and attendant to how it intersects with race, class. And we also talk in my course about gender, sexual orientation, disability, all other aspects uh, of American society. And just as a, a final word uh, before I turn it over to Dean McShay and or take uh, any questions is just, uh, as I said, with regard to uh, Boston College uh, Law School and studying law more generally. First of all, when it comes to, to the power of law, I think a lot of you are here because you sense uh, during these turbulent times that law equips us to understand uh, why systems, and whether it's governments or other systems, are working the way they do. And I think many of you are hungry for change and ways to make change. Well, the way to make that change is, is to learn the power of the law, learn the language of the law, and then you may be the one arguing in front of the Supreme Court uh, to change the way the death penalty is applied. Now, others of you may have no interest in criminal law. You may care about environmental law or corporate law or law relating to the music industry, entertainment law. The list is endless, but the unifying thing with all of them is the power of the law and the power that you will gain by studying the law. And finally, I'll say, you know, I have studied law at, at a variety of law, uh, I've, I've studied law and taught law at a variety of law schools around the country. And I think studying law at Boston College Law School is truly special. Uh, in addition to having uh, the highest quality students, faculty, staff, administrators, 
Uh, we also have a commitment to a Jesuit tradition that is oriented around uh, service to others. And we have an emphasis on community. Uh, I think Rachel and John who are here today and many others will say that Boston College Law School is, is a law school where students and faculty uh, talk amongst each other in a very open way about the law. Students talk with each other in a very open way about the law. Uh, and, and this broader tradition uh, of service to others, I think makes it a, a truly special place uh, to study the law. So with that, I wanna thank you for being here. I hope this gave you a sense of uh, what it's like to be in a, in a legal classroom. You all did an excellent job, despite the fact that uh, you're not law students yet. I know it can be very intimidating to be called on even over Zoom. So I'm grateful to you all for your attention and I hope to see you in the fall. And I'll turn it over to Dee McShay. Thank you, Professor Ko, and a special thank you to each one of you. Wow, you were amazing uh, presenting in class today. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I wanna reiterate, uh, Professor Ko, in that I hope you enjoyed your class and also highlight some of the points that he just made. You heard Professor Ko just mention them, uh, but for those of you who participated in our opening session, Last week, you also heard Dean Rajot speak to the three pillars of BC law, leading with educational excellence, with experiential learning opportunities in the great city of Boston. Uh, he spoke about our diverse and caring community. And he spoke about our commitment to student formation and social justice. Today, you've just experienced what student formation looks like in the classroom. And so now I want to continue and invite you to continue this journey with us uh, by registering for week three and week four of our Admitted Student Month. Uh, week three will focus on our community, which is told through the lens of a student perspective. It'll start with a uh, 20, 30 minute um, uh, panel, and then we'll go into one of our infamous BC Law Trivia Nights, uh, and that's going to be a wonderful opportunity and some great prizes there as well. And then for week four, which is the final uh, event for our Admitted Student Month series, we're going to go into Careers in Focus, uh, which will focus on a, an alumni panel, uh, and then we'll have a networking event with faculty, current students, uh, and additional alum. The registration for those events are now open. Feel free to visit the uh, virtual events on the admitted student page. And then finally, I wanna reiterate that we are continuing to release scholarship decisions. It is my hope that I will have all of the scholarship decisions released within the next two weeks. So thank you so much. Our first deposit deadline is April 15, so that'll give you some time to talk with us and still consider all of your additional options. But I hope after all of these experiences uh, and the more connected you get with the BC Law community that ultimately you do decide to join us. We'd love to have you be a part of this community. Thank you and have a wonderful and safe weekend. Take care, everyone.